Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO Frontiers North Adventures, John Gunter, and Interpretive Guide Frontiers North Adventures, Haley Shepard, in discussion with Skift Events Editorial Director, Elizabeth Osder. Hey. Hello, everybody. How are we doing this afternoon? It is getting late, and we're going to have some fun up here right now. I'm going to take you on a journey, a wonderful journey with two people who know that journey almost better than you can imagine. And we're going to get transformed from New York for a little while and go to some wild places. And so before we get started, I want to remind you that we will take questions, so submit them to us in the app. But I have two extraordinary leaders here uh, from um, the, the travel and tourism industry. We've got John Gunther, the CEO of Frontiers North, and Haley Shepard, an interpretive guide. And before we get started, I want to uh, show a little video that takes you to a place called Churchill uh, in the subarctic region. We just had another speaker from the subarctic region, so that's two in one uh, session. So we're, we're, we have a theme here. We're going very far north. So I'd like to roll the video and uh, let you experience a little bit about what these two wonderful people create. Pretty amazing, right? So John, tell us a little bit about Frontiers North. It's a, it's a company your family founded 30 years ago and you've been operating for the last 15 or so? Yeah, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks for having me back. <laughs> it's great to have you. <laughs> yeah, so Frontiers North is, uh, we're a little travel company. Uh, we are based in, uh, well, we, most of our operations occur in a little town of about 1,000 people on the west coast of Hudson Bay. So if you look at a map of North America, there's a great big body of water at the top in the middle called Hudson Bay. And Churchill's a little town of about 1,000 people on the west coast there. So what's really unique about Churchill is we have, uh, we're, we're really blessed to have uh, really the best access in the world to wild polar bears during the autumn. We have thousands of blue whales that come visit us in the mouth of the Churchill River each summer, and we're located directly under the Aurora Oval, so we have, we experience phenomenal northern lights. So Haley, if you weren't here today with us in New York City, what would you be doing in Churchill? I would, if in Churchill, I'd be either running a boat on the, on the Churchill River, um, showing the world belugas, and come fall, I'd be getting out of my boating gear and into the warmest gear that I own to then uh, guide, do interpretive guiding for Frontiers North in Churchill, October, November. So Haley, tell us a little bit about um, you know, what you do as an interpretive guide and what your role is on a, on a tour for Frontiers North. So my role as a guide, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, people have spent a lot of money, they've got high expectations, some of them are coming to Churchill to fulfill a lifelong dream of seeing a polar bear in the wild or experiencing beluga whales. Um, they want to have that experience, but my job is to give them that experience but keep them safe, but also sneak in some education so they're not only seeing the animal, but they're understanding um, the environment that this animal lives and thrives and, and survives, um, and really give them the whole kind of ecosystem, environmental, situation of how this animal survives in this area. So education, bit of entertainment, keeping them safe and fulfilling their dreams. That's my role. And John, your company's, you're a tour operator. You're, uh, and your feeling is that you, um, 
you've said to me over the years that you've partnered with Polar Bear International and that you want to collaborate with organizations that can bring um, expertise to the tours that you, you run. Tell us a little bit about that partnership. Right. So we have a, an interesting uh, relationship with a nonprofit polar bear conservation group called Polar Bears International, whose mission it is to conserve uh, polar bears and the sea ice on which they depend which ultimately boils down to messaging about uh, climate change and, uh, and uh, global warming. And so it's this natural fit we have as organizations where we're ushering our guests essentially to the perceived front line of climate change. Uh, but it's not necessarily the approach that we take when we're marketing the trips. Uh, when we're marketing our trips, we're selling on the romance of kayaking amongst dozens of beluga whales or dining under the northern lights or locking your gaze with a wild polar bear. And it's only once we have our guests into our system, as Haley referred to, uh, we kind of trick them. We sell the romance and then we're really passionate about uh, the sneaking educational elements. You're sneaking in some science. Yeah. Right? <laughs> sneaking in the educational elements of the trip and um, <clears throat> and preparing our guests, or I guess sort of informing our guests with the, the issues that affect not only the wildlife, which is really what sells the destination, but also issues that may affect the community as well. So I want to just take a minute um, and, I'm, and uh, really ask you, Haley, I think you've said it so articulate to me, the secret sauce in this is connecting with an animal. Mm -hmm and how you do that in your work and how you translate that. And um, I know it's a hard thing to conjure up for the moment, but I'd like mm. people to understand a little bit about, we saw those pictures of the polar bears and what you saw, what it's like to look in the eye of a polar bear, some of the other examples that you've given us that just provide those wake up moments for tours. It's, it's incredible. The best part of my job is actually um, experiencing uh, a guest's reaction when they've seen that first polar bear or experienced you know, 12 or 20 beluga whales following the boat that we're in, um, just to have these animals so curious about us, both polar bear, beluga whale. Um, it, it's, uh, that's my take home moments as a guide, is actually seeing these people that thought that they were just going to see an animal, tick it off there, I've seen a polar bear, bucket list, but instead they're going home with this intimate, having had this intimate experience with this animal, but connecting the dots as to all of our um, jobs as sort of planet citizens to actually take home that moment, that experience that moved us and continue with our lives, onto our lives with, with that memory because it does make you, it does change you. Having this intimate experience does change you as a person. You feel very humbled and appreciative of that experience. Well, I was, I was gonna jump in and say that I think we've succeeded as a company when our guests leave our destination uh, in, and remain invested in it. So either remain invested in a, in a social cause or remain invested in our wildlife. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, to, to start out the conversation, I, I really just wanted everybody to have a chance to imagine for a moment what a remarkable place that, you know, these folks get to work every day the precious corners of the planet that uh, few people get to see, and now with uh, travel and this industry, more and more people uh, get to go there. And I think one of the important questions that we've been asking in this co conference is a little bit about um, how to take care of our precious planet and those resources. Mm -hmm. And every company, we've heard from the titans of travel today, the CEO of Delta, the CEO of Carnival, the CEO of Hilton, on what they're doing. But these guys are on the ground uh, knocking things around and figuring it out together. They're teammates. They've been working together for a long time. And there's a great anecdote about uh, when you first came to Frontiers North um, about 15 years ago. Uh, what was getting on your nerves? <laughs> Many things, I think. But there well, was... <laughs> how long do I have? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, no. Um, we were, uh, as an educator and a guide, it is my job to... Uh, to to sort of walk the talk, I suppose. Yes. And here we were talking about um, conservation and how we can protect the polar bears and their habitat, which is crucial for their survival and really for our survival as well. You know, there's, there's when I'm standing up there talking, telling my guests, you know, you really should uh, 
Think about how much plastic that you use in your day-to-day -day life or the lights that we leave on all night long when we're sleeping. You know, take these little changes. And here we were, as we were educating, pass around water bottles to our guests. So that was a big, hey, John, Yeah. we got to do something here. So I, I had rationalized it to myself that, that uh, we were blowing out these water bottles in the same, like in the same region. Uh, we were transporting them north in our, and, and filling it with spring water, uh, transporting them north in our own flights that we operate. We operated a recycling program in the community where there wasn't one that existed in the first place. We collected our own recycling as well as the recycling of partners in the community. And then we flew it about 1,000 kilometers, about 600 miles south, back to an honest to goodness recycling program. So you, you had control of the supply chain and you thought you had a better way. And this is how I rationalized yep. it. It wasn't until my wife and I were standing on the beach of a small, uh, small country in West Africa with flip-flops and microplastics and water bottles was lapping up at our feet. And it was in. It's like, we're either part of the solution or we're part of the problem. And I, I went back to Haley. I said, Haley, I've got a great idea. Finally, <laughs> <Really? laughs> got a great Get idea. What bottles. I, I had, yeah. how many years yeah. ago? Okay. So, so it's uh, since then, and this is years ago, it's one little example. Uh, in a company like ours where we put a high value on our corporate social responsibility, but this is just one sort of story that illustrates uh, one, a one action that we've taken over the years. And I want to pivot for a minute, and um, Kaylee, you, you do some other work outside of Frontiers North. You're, you're, a, you're a contractor with Frontiers North, but you travel to some other far-flung places. places. What else do you do? I go down to Antarctica, and I'm an expedition leader on a ship that takes people to the Antarctic Peninsula, penguin, penguins, icebergs, whales, seals. And then I also actually um, run and an own and run a whale watching company in British Columbia, Vancouver Island, which is home for me. So Churchill for three months yeah. of, the, of the, well, no, two months of beluga season, six weeks polar bear season, and the rest of the year is. Is, is this anybody's dream? Everywhere. <laughs> I don't know if it's our dream or, or some, maybe it's a New Yorker's nightmare, but I, yeah. I don't really know. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, let's, let's take a moment to talk a little bit about, you both are involved in communities. You're both running small operations, and we have two very important points on the earth, and Guri just spoke about what's going on in the Faroe Islands, but um, Haley, talk to us a little bit about the work you do in Antarctica to try to control the flow of and the organizations that you work for. What's going on on the ground in Antarctica? You know, just to say, was, we, all, we all go on these trips now and we see more and more tourists mm -hmm. and we wonder and we worry. And there's real work on the ground by people that's different than what we're hearing from the other CEOs. So I started um, guiding in Antarctica uh, the year 2000. And at the time, there was probably about 10,000 people visiting and we would, never, we would never see another ship. And now we fast forward to 2019, um, we see oodles of ships per day, um, and there's probably about 80,000 plus people um, being, visiting Antarctica. So what, what, I am, what I like about the industry is that the tour operators, the competitors competing against each other, actually created an association because we were realizing that this, um, all of these visits and more and more people coming, that's certainly going to have an impact on, one, the guest experience, two, the animals that we're going to see, um, as well as ship traffic. So this association was formed um, in 1991, and every year there's an AGM, and we literally have added to the Antarctic Treaty which um, there's rules and regulations uh, involved with the Antarctic Treaty, but this is upping the ante. Us as a, as a tour operator industry is actually adding to the treaty. So we're actually um, creating um, guidelines and regulating ourselves with how we, um, how we operate in this industry. So for example, we set up a rule where no more than 100 people ashore um, we keep a, a, a certain distance from wildlife, whether it's um, seals, uh, penguins. Um, we, we remove ourselves from a beach and 
that area cannot be visited for a few hours to give the penguins time to not have visitors all the time. So there's th those kind of regulations. There's a, there's a number of, of other environmental um, steps that we've taken as an industry, and we literally sit together and share our best ideas, even though we're competing in the, in the market. It's really neat. John, if you could just uh, add on a little bit about what's going on in Churchill and on yeah. the ground there. Yeah, sure. We, uh, we have a small working group with, uh, with uh, the Blue Goyle tour operators, and we're working with Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans in determining the best way to navigate amongst our whales and, and to uh, be stewards for these whales. Uh, we work with Canada's uh, Parks Canada Agency. We operate in a national park, and as well, we work with we work in a uh, provincial uh, area that's protected and it's managed by the Ministry of Natural Resources. One thing that was interesting to me is, is you, um, your company was formed 30 years ago before, uh, for photographers and people who, right, you know, yeah. out in the wild. And since then, a national park has been created around your business and so yeah. forth and protections that are significant to the Canadian. Yeah, really, the, the, the market led the development of tourism in the Churchill area. And uh, it took a number of years before, before protected areas and national parks sprung up around areas where we, where we host guests. So you guys, one of the things that I love talking to you is because you're positive people. Does the state of the world and what people have been talking about today, does it depress you? How do you feel about it? What's, what's going on? I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, I, I think, you know, one the of the things that... Uh, we consider, we all talk about travel being transformative. I think everyone in this room wants our travel experiences to be transformative. Yeah, but what the heck does that even mean? And uh, we've, we've, uh, uh, we work with a couple of researchers, one from Virginia Tech, one from the University of Manitoba, and really gauging how guests, uh, do they change after a trip? How do they change? Why do they change? What, what uh, sort of preempts a change? And one of the things that we're finding is that just without getting too deep into the research, is that the guests need to be open to having a transformative experience. It could be you know, learning how to better take photographs, or it could be uh, wanting to learn about you know, how their, their actions, when they go back home, could positively benefit these experiences in our, our remote places. Did you want to add anything? I, I suppose... For me, um, as a guide, I'm representing the company that I work for, but I'm also actually more wholeheartedly representing the animal that I'm showing people or the, the, the community that I'm bringing people to. So that's sort of, we're on the front line of delivering the final product and or final service. And because it, for, for me and my line of work, it's, it's to do with the wildest, most remote places on the planet and the animals that are you know the symbol of the north, and um, so it does worry me when I when I hear there's two Hiltons getting built every day. Was that the, was that? It's like what, what are they building it on? Is it polar bear habitat? You know. So I start to my heart starts to flutter. So I want to uh, uh, yeah I want when a when a guest guests are getting smarter when they're choosing who they're traveling with. They actually are choosing the airline that is perhaps more... Um, that aligns with their point of view, yeah. or aligns with their ethos, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think people put their money where their mouth is. If yeah. you can raise their yeah. consciousness around bringing back, making better choices, they will make better from choices. From start to finish, from when they book online to when they're getting on the plane to when they're going to the hotel to then when they're standing on the tundra buggy with me and I'm showing them a polar bear, I want every single step to have that environmental awareness and choices They've made certain choices be, and they've chosen the right, right. Play, companies to travel with or, yeah. So I'm gonna go to audience questions. Um, we have only a few, two, little bit of time left and before I wanna wrap it up with a final question for you all, which is in your years, in, so here's one from Anonymous. We all know Anonymous. They've been very present here today. In your years <laughs> in Churchill, have you been able to observe visible impacts of climate change? I got a hot take on this. You wanna, yeah. I'll go first. You, yeah, you sure. go first. Um, yeah, so in the, the decades, I, I grew up in this small town and uh, now work there quite a bit. And I can, I can say with confidence, the biggest bears that we see today aren't as big as they used to be. And that is, uh, um, that is uh, as a direct result of 
the ice on the bay, uh, Hudson Bay forming later in the autumn and melting earlier in the spring. And bears need to be out on that ice to hunt and eat seals, and that's their primary food source. So, uh, you know, when that, when that period of uh, sea ice reduces, it, uh, it just results in smaller bears. Mm -hmm. And smaller bears don't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so. eventually they won't. So um, does your co co company get involved in politics in order to push climate or progressive legislation? Uh, we do. Well, just by, by our support of Polar Bears International, who uh, their senior scientist was uh, pulled on the Capitol Hill last month. So they're, they're actively lobbying and uh, actively trying to change legislation. Um, and our support of, of PBI, I think just sort of this vis-a-vis -vis relationship is that we're politically active. And then closer to home, in our own uh, province, uh, I'm taking a lot of meetings with, with uh, politicians and yep, yep. I'm, I'm not necessarily doing it Overtly, but it's a lot of a lot of closed well, meetings to try and. I, I think you've been a strong. Your company is a great example of strong corporate social responsibility. It's a small company, but it's you're on the ground making a difference. You know, our topic for this session, and there's so much we could talk up here for a long time. I think people could, would really enjoy it. But uh, was you know, for our session is travels responsibility to the world and tourism stewardship, and the idea was to talk about what's everybody's role. And I think that uh, what I wanted to sort of wrap up our conversation today. Um, is two things. One is, as I think, um, from from a um, from an operator point of view, you know, what's your role as a company leader in preserving these precious places, but also trying to build a successful business and grow it and diversify your product. Yeah, we we talk about uh, we talk about issues like over tourism in our community, and we may uh, we may or may not uh, achieve over tourism. It's something, it, these are definitions that we need to get together as a community and define. We may not get there for 15 or 20 years, but I think they're important conversations to have now because that over-tourism signpost is really difficult to do anything about once you've blown past it. Uh, so we're, we're just, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a bit of capacity to grow our polar bear stuff. We have a lot of capacity to grow our northern lights. And yeah, we're, we're, we're making sure that we grow in a measured, and uh, informed way, um, but we're we're conscious of the you're, steps. You're we're conscious of there's only so, so there's much a carrying you, capacity you, to our destination. You have a responsibility to run a run a company that is forward looking, and and, and so forth. So Haley, you're you, I know you're a tour operator now on one boat someplace, but let's talk <laughs> about you as an interpretive guy. What's your responsibility on these tours? My responsibility is to to. Um, blow people's minds just by the simplicity of having a one-on-one -on -one with a wild animal. And when that person has been moved by seeing a bear, a polar bear, literally big paws up on the tundra buggy, sniffing and you feeling its breath on your cheek, I mean, wow, that's a wow, wow moment. Have that wow moment, and then my job is to create ambassadors as far as if you come to see polar bears with me, you've got a job to do when you get home. You need to spread this word that the experience that you had, we want, we want your little kids to have that experience. So do something that gives back to that experience that you just had with that very precious wild animal. So, and I think the important point here is this is not, this is not uh, Churchill specific. Like this, we should yeah. all be thinking about this, is... this for all of our destinations mm -hmm. and how we all manage our businesses. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have, but I really wanted to, in this session, really get everybody to think about what's their role. And I think this role of the ambassador mm -hmm. is when you take these precious experiences, we need to take them home and carry the message. And it's rarely that we get to talk to people who are actually on the front lines of such incredible work. And we wish we had more time to hear from you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thanks, John.